Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Abner and Dan Wolfenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by Bet Online, AG1, or a Mint Mobile, and Rock Solid Sports Memorabilia. If this is your first time tuning in the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, week one for the Chargers officially in the books. And before we get started with the recap of the Chargers... Let's just call it for the sake of argument, at least for now, disappointing loss to the Miami Dolphins. I'd like to issue a statement, Dan, to you and to the Chargers fans who have been listening to this show over the last six months and basically say, for all the time that you have tuned into this show and you have seen Jay Kefner with a smile on his face and the lauded optimism that has come out from me during the course of this offseason, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. Because it's about time for pessimistic Jake to return. And it's and it starts today. And a lot of you may not like what I have to say in today's show, but I had to make that known before we kick things off because obviously there is a lot to get into after the Chargers lost to the Miami Dolphins in their season opener, 36 to 34. Uh, Dan Walkenstein, my friend, co-host, I hope you are prepared. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I mean, look, I'm not going to be the most optimistic on this one either. It's hard to sugarcoat. You and I talked about before this season is all about results and the coulda, woulda, shoulda stuff. And, you know, the the sugarcoating, the losses and all the kind of stuff like I'm kind of past that. This is year three with Brandon Staley at the helm. And quite simply, at least from the defensive side, that was an embarrassing performance by this defense. Seemingly nothing they did worked. And even when they got to third and long, it didn't work. They were getting feasted on all day. Whatever adjustments Brandon Staley said that they tried to do didn't work. Defense just couldn't get off the field, which is unfortunate because the offense looked pretty darn good, all things considered. So that's a lone bright spot, but we'll get into all of that kind of t- key takeaways and overarching like what do we do with this and kind of try to put it in its perspective but also let jake hefter and myself sort of vent and try to explain our emotions and somehow maybe somewhat give a voice to what we've seen from chargers fans who are upset who are worried who are scared and who want to see change we hear you we're with you. And I guess with that, the table's been set. The napkin, I guess, instead of dolphins being served, uh, looks like lightning bolts were had uh, by the dolphins as they won 36 34 in a track meet. Jake, before we get into kind of the game that was probably going to be hopefully forgotten at some point, uh, coming off of that dreadful Jacksonville loss, this is now six quarters where this defense has just looked abysmal and we'll get into why but before we get into all of that uh jake let's talk about our friends over at aura athletic athletic identity theft prevention uh you can save millions on possible threat fraud uh robo callers spammers uh folks who are trying to get information from you getting your money all that kind of stuff uh there are some snipers out there all over the place so do your best to prevent all of that our friends over at Aura are giving away two free weeks as a trial to kind of get you set up to see if your stuff hacks has already been locked or now has already been uh, hacked. Jake, let's talk about this Chargers disastrous defensive performance after we hear from our friends about Aura on Chargers Unleashed. <laughs> Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? <gasps> Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. We've been trying to reach you concerning your car's extended warranty. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. And brokers everywhere are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it it's super hard to do. So let Aura handle that for you. You could try Aura for up to two weeks using this link that we're going to put up here on the screen. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you cannot see. 
So make sure to check out Aura.com backslash Chargers Unleashed to get a 14-day free trial and see if your personal information has been leaked online. Jake, I have a feeling that Chargers fans, all they want to hear about is positivity and what went right in that game. No, I'm, I'm obviously kidding. That's not at all what we want to eat. Want, I, I mean, we could, we could highlight that, but it's only going to be about 30 seconds of the show. <laughs> we'll get into that towards the end, because I think right now all eyes and all concerns are on that defensive side. Jake, the Chargers had all offseason. Brandon Staley had all offseason. This team has all of its horses on defense, aside from depth, two depth pieces on the edge, which in this game would not have met. Everyone's healthy. JC Jackson's back. Derek Ansley at the helm alongside Brandon Staley, but Brandon Staley sits at the top of that helm, I guess. And this defense gives up 466 yards to Tua Tugavailoa, who had the best game of his career by far hats off to Tua. Like we've said here, we are not Tua haters. We think he's a great quarterback and he showed why this game. Tyreek Hill goes for $200 bills, 215 yards on 15 targets with a long of 47. Jalen Waddle gets 80 yards, 78 by his own right. Over 500 yards of offense generated by this Dolphins offense. And the Chargers defense had zero answer other than two fumbles by or two fumbles by Tua. One of which we recovered. One one of them counted. One of them didn't. Uh, Then we got the interception by JC Jackson, which cool. Good for him. I think other than those, they had how many punts did they have? Like, oh, zero. They had no punts, (laughs) by the way. I thought thought they punted it one time. Did they? Throughout, I think it was 11 possessions they had. I'm sorry, you're right. You're right. You're right. They had one punt. I'm sorry. So essentially, three possessions. They did not score. (laughs) Disastrous. You were hoping at some point you're watching this game, Jake, and you're like, all right, it's third and 15. It's third and 18. It's third and 10. It's third and eight. All right, one of these are not going to get. And it just seemed like they all were gotten. I'm kind of at a loss for words. Jake, like, how? I know how you were feeling during this game. <laughs> Definitely. What do you make? Like, but what should Chargers fans? Well, I guess two part. One, how would you summarize what Chargers fans are feeling? And two, what should Chargers fans feel? I mean, I think it's. I, I mean, it's disappointment overall, Dan. And it's kind of just still playing, and then it's also a combination of playing the waiting game here disappointment because the Chargers had four games last year where they scored 30 or more points. They won all those games. And when you hang up 34 on any opponent, regardless of who they are, you should be expected to win that game, especially in the fashion that the Chargers did. They rushed over 100 yards. They kept the opposing team to less than 100 rushing yards. They actually did great as it relates to rush defense, even though the Miami offense didn't need it. You got two turnovers and you didn't turn the ball over. And the stat that historically has come up is that teams in that scenario are 110 and zero. And the Chargers made history yesterday being on the wrong side of it because they are now the one team in that column. So you just, you can't give up something like that. And I think it's more of the standpoint of frustration, Dan, which is Tyree Kill has haunted the Chargers, whether he was on the Chiefs or on the Miami Dolphins, for years. So this should have come as no surprise as far as what Miami was going to try to do. And we had talked about it in the pregame between him and Jalen Waddell and how Tua was, of course, going to try to attack that. Mike McDaniel came in with a great game plan, which honestly wasn't too much different than what he tried to do last year. This year, he just got Tua got it off faster, and the execution of what he wanted to do in his game plan worked. And so, the Chargers were night and day different in their scheme. Correct. This year versus last. It was a ridiculous 180 from how they were able to hold this team to 17 points. And given the players that weren't playing last year, how they were able to do that. Your question, Dan, is how Chargers should be feeling. Well, 
if we're which, which that might be unfair to to ask you because like everyone's entitled to their own feelings their beliefs but like i'm trying to put this in context here here's probably what i would say as far as if i'm just gonna make an estimation of it and in the biggest context of things and i'm trying to separate both the offense and the defense because this was not a cincinnati game where the Bengals were just couldn't do anything offensively this was not the dallas versus the giants game where the opposing team hangs up 40 and the uh, other team is not able to do anything offensively. This was a game that was a shootout that Dan and I believed it was going to be definitely the most entertaining of the entire NFL slate as far as competition goes. And you knew what was coming when Miami come to town. It's very hard to contain this offense when they have these weapons. But I think what is the biggest question mark, Dan, is how long we have been waiting to see the Brandon Staley defense that was created and vaunted and gave him as that reputation while he was with the Rams, because this stat doesn't make sense to me, Dan. The fact that the Chargers have scored more points than any other team over the last three years, and yet their defense has given up more points than any other team over the last three years. It does not make sense, which has obviously hindered the Chargers from playoff appearances in past years and what ultimately led to their demise in the game against Jacksonville last year. So I think we're just waiting to see when are we finally going to see it? And now you had this entire roster back healthy. You had all of your weapons. You had deficiencies for Miami on the offensive line that we talked about that the Chargers had to take advantage of. They had to own the trenches on both sides of this game. Defensively, they did not do that whatsoever. Well, honestly, I think defensively they did, but it didn't matter. Like you saw Daniel Jeremiah put out like a tweet this morning showcasing how they were literally letting Bosa, Mac, Fox folks run free without even being blocked. And they're going straight to the quarterback and two is releasing it before he even gets to him. So like they won the trenches aside from the last series on defense for the dolphins. Otherwise the Chargers owned it and the dolphins just took it and did it matter. I, again, I think the, what people were waiting for is that, Tyreek Hill goes off for 100 yards before even halftime. So so at what point are you going to flip the switch to say, hey, let's not have this guy beat us anymore? And then second half, apparently nothing changed. And you, saw Khalil Mack on, you saw Khalil Mack first play lined up against Tyreek Hill. In Correct. what world is that okay? Like, I would rather see the Chargers of Brandon City call a timeout and say, whoa, on the first play, like, we're, no, we're not doing this. That's unacceptable. There's no way that should happen, especially on the first play. And I think that's what's so frustrating is this Chargers defense has studs all over the place. Yet for some damn reason, they cannot get it together against these juggernaut of offenses, which, you know, you take with a grain of salt because this Dolphins offense will probably finish the league top three, top five. It's going to make a lot of defenses look silly. But there has to be some pushback from your defense, even if you're getting, you know, in this buzzsaw all game long. Like, there's got to be some time where you can kind of flex a little bit on defense. And you just didn't see it. Even when the Chargers got the interception, even when they got the red zone fumble recovery, that's in the red zone. Like, the team went all the way down the field, which, sure, bend but not break. But, like, come on, you're living on the high wire with that it's just demoralizing and i was there i was at the game i watched this and you felt pretty damn confident throughout the game even with all of the negativity on defense that the chargers could find a way to pull this thing out and then finally on the last series the dolphins defense said you know what we're coming Screw it. and the Chargers' offensive line couldn't hold up Justin Herbert kind of made somewhat of a mistake. Intentional grounding, got behind the sticks. The rest is history. You heard Brandon Staley at the podium talk about like, you know, we tried making some adjustments. I haven't watched the All-22 yet, but I think it's safe to say whatever adjustments they either made, didn't make, doesn't matter, clearly didn't work. It's just demoralizing when you have a, a guy brought in to fix a defense. And I understand, like, you know, last year there was the injuries. And then before that, there were 
he's done a lot of things to fix other parts of this team. You came in as a defensive guy. I would argue the talent on this defense is better than what he had on the Rams. And for whatever damn reason, they have these boneheaded performances like this that are just inexcusable. Now, is this Dolphins making the Chargers look silly and it's going to happen all the time when the Dolphins go up against someone? Possibly. Like, both things can be true. But when you got all your horses, you cannot look that bad with how much they've invested in this defense. It's just one game. I get it. Well, I'm not sugarcoating this, but it's true. It's just one game. But it's just disheartening, I think, is something that a lot of Chargers fans, it just takes the wind out of your sail. Like, there is such an opportunity here to pull this one out, and they just didn't. And it takes away from some of the positives that were, quite frankly, very positive. Sure. But again, we'll get to. I was going through, in, in your in your estimation, Jake, like what what part of the defense brought the most struggle? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, I would say at every level you had issues. Obviously, with Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa not being able to take advantage of uh, Gerard Armstead not being in this game, that was one. Brandon Staley tried to get creative a few times with Derwin James on a blitz off the side, just wasn't able to capitalize either going after Tua or even a run that was going to be stopped in the backfield. And unfortunately, he just wasn't able to bring down for negative yardage. Middle of the field was a mess. The combination of Eric Kendricks and Kenneth Murray did not pan out the way that we thought it was going to. Specifically again, in coverage, right? Specifically in coverage, yes. I'm not talking about against the run here, which we obviously know that that's what Eric Kendrick was brought in for. But again, but in coverage, woof, woof. And you expected the fact that you had the type of performance that you had last year against the Miami Dolphins. And the fact that you were getting a more experienced Jasir Taylor, the return of JC Jackson. Now you have a Louis Gilman who's obviously built himself into the starting role at the free safety, safety spot. Asante Samuel Jr. after the work that he has put in throughout training camp and preseason and has just looked phenomenal out there on the field. You expected somewhat of a better game plan to how you were going to utilize your secondary. And the fact was, is that it never changed. You stayed in man about 85 to 90% of this, in the entirety of this game. And when it came down to it, any opportunity that your defense got, Mike McDaniel was the one that was fearless because Jasir Taylor had a great play that broke up a pass and it was third down. But when the Chargers found themselves in third and long situations, they just simply could not get on the field. They could not make a play. How about the fourth and seventh play where Mike McDaniel takes one out of Brandon Staley's book and the Miami Dolphins convert? Wide open, by the way. The fact that the Chargers allowed the Miami Dolphins to go down the field in nine seconds and get off a field goal before halftime, after you had just gone and scored yourself, which would be a great way to go into the half, as Dan likes to talk about a lot on this show, owning the middle eight, which has been the the, the phrase of this, which personally, from them scoring there, and then when they got the ball in the second half, they did that. The unfortunate part was they couldn't stop anybody else from scoring against them, and they ended they gave, up in they a They gave three points. You cannot... You. In a game like that, you cannot gift a team three points when they there is no way they should have gotten three points. And the manner in which that JC Jackson made that penalty was just like you and I know not to do that. That was like I'm not that was stupid. Like that was stupid. And then for them to give up a 30 plus, I think it was like 30 plus yards or 25 plus yards in the game, the play before that eight seconds left in halftime. You just went up three. Like that, that was largely the game aside from all the other boneheaded stuff that you saw. That was the game. Jake, listen to some of these. I wanted to kind of go through this. Uh, Tackling grades. Ready? This is according to PFF. Mm. JT Woods, 
14 plays. He had, you know, I'm just going to go through a little list here. JT Woods, 83.6 grade. Eric Kendrick, 78.6. Kenneth Murray, 76.9, which we'll get to in a second. Tooley, 74. Joey Bosa, 69. Elohi Gilman, 69. All those guys were tackling wise, played well. Notice the theme here, Jake. Ready? The guys that do not tackle well Asante Samuel Jr., corner, 30.8. Very red. Derwin James, safety, 29.4. JC Jackson, 23.2. Your secondary could not tackle. That's what lost you the game. And the thing that you and I talked about going into this game was, can the Chargers stop the yards after the catch? And that's going to require them to tackle when called upon. And the answer to that was, resoundingly, hell no, they couldn't. Is that because they were put in the wrong position? Largely. It seemed like the Chargers defensive scheme put these guys in positions to fail all day long. Like you can't expect a guy to be single coverage against Tyree Kill and win. Like, that, who does that? that that's so, what? Not great. I struggle because this is just me being honest, Jake. I am, I might get some heat for this. I am still all in on Brandon Staley as the head coach being kind of the guy at the helm of this team. Weirdly, I question, I think rightly so, Brandon Staley as a defensive coach. I, I don't know if that's correct, but I could just tell you from how I feel. I think he is a great leader. I think he is great at kind of galvanizing guys, changing the culture, blah, blah, like all of that stuff, the soft stuff, right? The leadership mentality. But for whatever reason, the play call, whether maybe he's too smart for his own good with some of these play calls and the schemes designs, maybe he needs to simplify things and just let these guys go. I, I don't know. But so far, I get asterisk, so far through one game and largely through the last two seasons, aside from maybe a month stretch last year, this defense hasn't been able to do what he has asked. Is that the players? Is it the coach? Or is it both? Again, it, I'm trying to put the context of we're still going up against the Chargers. are still going up against a juggernaut of an offense. So I don't want to put all of these labels after one week against arguably one of the top three offenses in the NFL. Like if this was going up against the Titans next week and they give up 400 yards or 250 yards on the ground, what a different story. So I like a part of me is kind of thinking like this is an outlier, but one that is very concerning perhaps if we see them later in the year, but I just, I just, like that, that just was painful. And it was unfortunate because you saw like Justin Herbert had a pretty darn good game. Wasn't perfect. Made a couple errant throws, a couple bad decisions. The running game was absolutely fantastic. You got over 200 yards rushing. When's the last time you saw that in the regular season? You, you got two guys almost 100 yards. Like the running game, the run blocking was good. The pass protection for the most part was good. Your special teams was fantastic. Cameron Dicker nails a 50 yard field goal. Your punting was great aside from the one you're backed up in your own end zone. But like, it's kind of hard to blame him for that. Your coverage was good. Offensive game plan for the most part, which Jake, I think we should get to here now. For the most part, the offensive cover offensive game plan was good. And we're highlighting the defense here. And I think we're going to get, we're going to have to have another episode where we kind of get into the like specifics of the defense more. But there were a couple things on offense that perturbed me. And I might get heat for this. And I'm not at all blaming the offense for this loss. That is not what I'm doing. Like more blame goes to the defense and the head coach and the defensive caller than anybody in this game. Period. End of story. But there is some blame, some, to some of the guys on offense. Some of the play calls on third and short when your running game is working all day long were questionable. The Quentin Johnston kind of gimmick play, I don't know why they did that on third and short. 
There was a third and short that they could have run in the back of the end zone when they were backed up where Justin Herbert took the sack on the one yard line, almost a safety easily should have just been a third and one. And then I think there was one more that did not work, but sometimes they got a little cute unnecessarily. So, and could have just went out there and tried to win the game versus like, I don't know. Um, I just, and then at last possession, like, I understand the defense sucked. I understand that they did the offense really no favors. The Dolphins go down and score, miss the extra point. You're down just two. You got the two minute, you got two minute drill. You got the 50 plus million dollar quarterback at the helm. Two timeouts. Two timeouts. All of those weapons. You got to go 40 yards and kick a game winning field goal. That should have happened. There is no excuse for that not happening, regardless of what the defensive guys over at Miami did. You got a franchise quarterback with that much talent and an offensive coordinator and all those weapons. That game still should have been won by LA. And it wasn't. So I'm not absolving the offense either. Now, again, way more blame goes to the defense. But what did you make of the offense as a whole. I mean, we've said it on this show, Dan. I think if you can get this offense balanced to where Justin Herbert doesn't have to play Superman all the time, it, it could be more lethal because it's so versatile. And the fact that the Chargers were able to run the ball so well, given where they were last year, if you want to put any positivity on Brandon Staley today, one of the biggest emphasis that he worked on, and obviously bringing in Kellen Moore was a big factor, of that was they had to improve running the football. The lanes that the Chargers offensive line were opening for the run game were fantastic. Austin Eckler hitting those holes. Joshua Kelly looked great running through them. The Chargers generating that many rushing yards, being able to control the clock. Uh, The first drive that they went down, 94 yards. They threw only two passes on that drive, and they marched down the field and were continuous in rushing the football very productively. That's why that third and one play, when they're backed up against their own end zone, and the Chargers all of a sudden decide that this is the right time to go empty formation and Justin Herbert and shotgun when you've been running the ball at six yards a clip all day. So, yes, there's plenty to take away from the offense. The fact that the Chargers scored that many points is a positive to take away. It just shows, I don't even think that we got a chance to see the Justin Herbert that everybody was expecting to see out of the gates, given the fact that Kellen Moore is now the offensive coordinator. So that may just give, that may actually be a good thing in hindsight from the standpoint to say, look at what this offense did without Justin Herbert having to light up the scoreboard. And look what they're capable of doing without that, which is, which is good. And Justin Herbert, Managed the game, I thought, very well. I know just over 200 yards, a uh, passing touchdown to Donald Parham and a rushing touchdown, no turnovers, protected the ball well. Just didn't, obviously, Vic Fangio just hit screw it on that final drive, and they brought the house because they probably had the same thought that everybody else did, that that game was going to come down to who had the ball last and was going to win. And after the Dolphins had just missed that field goal, Fangio <laughs> says, well, our defense, just as much as the Chargers had, Maybe not as bad, but the Dolphins defense wasn't doing them any favors all day either, especially in the passing game or the rushing game. So Vangio says, okay, well, if any moment is going to win me the game right now, I'm going to do this. And in a three-play sequence, outside of Justin Herbert doing an intentional grounding, he brought pressure and it got through. And that put the nail in the coffin for the Chargers offense, which ultimately resolved them losing the game. So yes, offensively, there's a lot to take away from that's positives and hopefully things that you can build on moving forward over these next 16 weeks. But Dan, I go back to the one thing, if you want to take away a constant to say, okay, well, the Chargers have now finally got away from Joe Lombardi, Kellen Moore, obviously that's a good first step to go on. But the thing that has been constant over the last three years, the Achilles heel of this team has been What's the defense going to do on a week-to-week basis? And defensively, are there ever going to be any adjustments that are made? I I, I don't know. That I don't know. Because I feel like this is an episode from 2022. Because I'm saying the exact same things that that I was criticizing this Chargers defense for last year in terms of their game planning 
and their lack of ability to make adjustments at certain points of the game. That when something is beating you, that opposing team is going to keep doing it unless you figure out a way to stop them. This is going to be a long week for Chargers fans. And it's going to be hard to not hit the panic button, which obviously many have. And I understand why. I do somewhat challenge Chargers fans and you, Jake, to allow yourself the ability to kind of pause all of the finality decisions of whether it's, you know, fire Brandon Staley or whether it's, you know, bench whoever. Like, again, I think this is going to look very different going up against any other offense. It's going to have to. And that's including the Chiefs, the Bengals, the Bills. Like, Tyreek Hill scares the hell out of me and anybody. And what's, I think, frustrating is that they continuously got Tyreek Hill open. If, like, double, triple team, I don't care. Like, he's the one guy. Maybe Jalen Wall is the other, but Tyreek Hill for sure. That should not be you. And he did. So moving forward, these next three games going into the bye, going to be huge, obviously. Much different offenses they're going up against. I think that is going to kind of come back to reality a little bit in terms of like the stats and all that jazz. I am not saying that Chargers fans are wrong to be upset or to be nervous or scared or call for change. I'm all of those things. But I do ask Chargers fans to kind of channel that and allow this to play out because here's the reality. It will do the Chargers more harm than good if they make instant reactions like, okay, let's fire Brandon Staley. What good does that do? Like, honestly, what good does that do? Who's going to be, what are you going to do from there? There's no other head coach that's going to be coming in at least this season. Now, next season, again, we'll see how it plays out. We're one game in. The one game sucked on defense. Let's, let's let it extrapolate out, see where the cards lie, and go from there. I have been very public with my red line, so to speak, of what the Chargers need to do and what Brandon Staley specifically needs to do in order for me to be, personally, for whatever it's worth, cool with him sticking around. Through one game, three of the four major things that I have in my red line have been improved. The one obvious is scoring defense. That was not. We'll see. It's all about results. At the end of the day, you need a playoff win or a divisional round appearance, or it's over. Jake, how do you, how do we even want to end this? I guess the best way to say this, Dan, is that from what you're saying, as bad as the defense was yesterday, and we're talking historically the worst in 20 years bad that we have seen from this team, maybe the only silver lining is the fact that it happened against, as you said, the most dangerous receiver in the game, top three offense, and the fact that it happened in week one. Now, I'll say this. If the Chargers were not motivated enough from all the film and all the questions that they had to have asked, been asked about the running game, the explosive plays that they let happen, obviously the Jacksonville debacle. If that wasn't enough motivation for them coming into this season, I hope that what they're watching in the film room is going to help them out. Because the next, what, three, three, four games that you have, it's Tennessee, it's Minnesota, it's the Raiders, and it's Dallas. Now, you're going to have Justin Jefferson to contend with in there. You're going to, in my opinion, probably three out of the four of those teams have a better defense than what you just played against. So I don't think that you're going to be able to put up as many points as you did today. I would love to be proven wrong on that. (laughs) But as Dan said, it's going to be a much different looking game. The Chargers aren't going to be rushing for over 200 yards against Tennessee. I will tell you that much right now. They're going to have to attack that in a much different what way. What if they do? But what if they do? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you get my point. <laughs> yes. You get my point. So you're going to have to write the ship and quick, mm-hmm. especially when we're talking about uh, 
the Chargers getting to the playoffs once again, and especially after just moments ago, Chris Jones officially ended his holdout with the Kansas City Chiefs, and he is back on a one-year deal. So everybody who was hoping that he was going to hold out until wake eight after the Chargers played the Chiefs the first game, unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. So you got to make up ground. You have to make up ground, and it's got to start next this coming week. Yeah, again, Chargers fans, we feel you. That was a hard pill to swallow. Um, demoralizing, debilitating, depressing. Just not the way you want to start the season for Los Angeles Chargers who are looking for redemption all over the place, some of which they were able to redeem. Others are going the wrong direction. But again, let this thing play out. On to Tennessee, sort of this week. But uh, Jake, I think that'll do it. Short and sweet. Some emotions had. Uh, after we had a day to kind of simmer on this, which I don't know about you. I didn't sleep. Great. That sucked. Um, I think I'll do it for this one. Uh, Jake Hefner, Dan Wilkenstein, Charges Unleashed. Again, we're not trying to sugarcoat things. We're trying to bring this to you as real and as um, raw, if you will, uh, as we can. Next, we'll be kind of talking about this a little bit more, going into some of the details and get into, obviously, the Tennessee stuff. But until then, Jake after Dan Wolf, it's time to start the leash, and we'll talk to you guys on the next one.